All right. Well, welcome back, everybody, to Ultron Grand Rounds this week. Pretty excited to be here. We are wrapping up just a three-week mini series on lung ultrasound. So a couple of weeks ago, we talked about just long, basic lung ultrasound, lung siding, A lines, B lines, and consolidations. Last week, we added to that by adding the effusions piece. And then today, I thought it'd be really helpful if we went through and just talked about the application of lung ultrasound. So with all this data, with all this information, you know, how do we apply this to our patients and how do we make some decisions with this? Because that's really the piece we left out, right? We didn't talk so much about, you know, what all these things mean and how to interpret that, but we talked kind of about what they were in the last few weeks. So if you missed any of that, if you want to go back and catch some more of that, you want to see that, review what we've done, go back to our YouTube channel, youtube.com, and then our channel is Metro Health Emergency Ultrasound. We've put all those videos up there. In fact, I just posted the plural Fusions one this morning. Um, so it should be up there for you guys to see uh, and be able to review and look back and kind of remind yourself of what we talked about. Um, but with that said, let us cut on over to our slide for today or our lecture for today. And we'll do a little bit of a brief recap for those who haven't watched the, the previous videos, but um, we are going to talk about application of lung ultrasound today. And as always, no disclosures to make that are pertinent to this presentation. And again, a quick shout out. I, I mentioned the YouTube channel, um, Metro Health Emergency Ultrasound. This is where we are storing the lectures that we've done so that you guys can go back and look at them again. You can review them. You can see kind of interesting things. I've also been posting these YouTube shorts. You kind of notice that up at the top. Um, just real quick, less than one minute hits about something interesting also on whether it be a normal finding, an abnormal finding, a teaching point, something like that. A uh, real fun way just to kind of sit and just in a 10, you know, or a 30 to, to 60 second, you know, quick hit, you can get just a little piece of information. So go take, check that out. Be sure to share this with your friends. I'm actually really excited. Our following is growing on YouTube, uh, which means we're getting our word out. We're getting uh, other people excited about what we're doing. So be sure to like the channel or subscribe to the channel, um, hit the notification button so that you get notified when new new um, videos come out and share the videos with your friends. If you find something particularly helpful, you know, say, hey, I saw this was really cool. Let me send this to you um, and get the word out with us um, about bedside ultrasound. So with that said, that little shameless plug, right, we are going to pop over into uh, the today's topic. And we'll start with a little bit of a review, right? Because it's always helpful to kind of go back and remind ourselves of what we talked about in previous weeks, so that we can set the stage for what we're going to talk about today and is how do we then apply all this information, right? And there's an interesting article that will be helpful in that endeavor, right? So remember, the very first thing that we want to know as we're scanning these patients is, is there lung sliding? Yes or no, right? It's the easy, very uh, binary, like, do you see sliding? Do you not see sliding? And we can use that to make decisions um, with regards to the patient's source or cause of their dyspnea, right? So that's number one thing. Do you see lung sliding? We see there the rib and the rib that are bookending each side of the image and right beneath the rib, that bright hyperocoque line immediately beneath the ribs, right? That is going to be the plural line. So that's the landmark that we're looking for on all of our images that we want to find that plural line. And first and foremost, we want to see that that plural line moves, right? We want to see it go left and go right as the patient breathes in and breathes out, uh, you know, to, to assess essentially, is there, you know, correct apposition of the visceral and the parietal pleura in this patient, right? And so in this situation, right, this is an example of me. And so I've never had a pneumothorax in my life. And so this is a normal one, right? This is normal lung sliding um, as I'm breathing in and out. Um, I took this clip a long time ago, but anyway, I'm still breathing this way, right? The next thing we want to talk about is the A, B, C, D, E's of lung ultrasound, right? And everything in medicine, right? I found this one to be kind of interesting. Everything in medicine can be either alliterated in A, B, C, D, E, or there can be a metaphor to food. I mean, think about it. You know, we talk about various different, this sign that's a metaphor to food or A, B, C, D, E. So in an ACLS, you know, airway, breathing, circulation, disability, exposure, that's actually a TLS in a, a I'm getting my word salad mixed up here, a CLS, it's ABCs, airways, breathing and circulation. So anyway, but in lung ultrasound, A, B, C, D, E, right? And we're just going to, I mean, I guess a little bit of a cheat because we're going to knock off the D part, but A for A lines, B for B lines, C for consolidative pattern and E for effusion. So those are the four cardinal findings that we're going to look for on our lung ultrasound um, as we're doing these patients, right? Or, or scanning these patients. And so the first one is this A-line pattern, right? Um, 
you can see that um, you have that long, that rib, rib on bookending either side, that plural line, that bright plural line. And then below that, deep in the screen is another one, right? We know that the patient doesn't have two plural lines. They have one plural line. But what we see is a reverberation of that plural line. So sound comes and bounces off that plura, bounce, it goes back up and bounces off the bottom of the probe, and then goes back down and see kind of this reverberation in different harmonics of the plural line as we're scanning uh, in this patient. And this is a line. This is a pattern. This is generally considered to be a normal pattern. Now, you can have patients with hyper aeration uh, problems that cause their dyspnea, asthma, COPD, that will present with A lines. Um, but generally speaking, A line is considered to be a normal, well aerated lung, right? Contrast that with B lines, which are these bright white lines that originate from the pleura, right? They go all the way to the bottom of the screen without fading, right? Uh, and you see them moving back and forth with the lung siding. So they're, they're emanating from the pleura. And this represents thickening of that interstitial space for whatever reason, right? We have a lot of different reasons we're going to talk about in a little bit, but this is the B line um, that can represent that thickening of the interstitial space, right? Followed by our C pattern, I guess you can't call it a line, it's a C pattern, which is our consolidations. And what we start seeing is normal lung, you you know, we're interpreting artifacts, right? Lung is based on the inter based on the, the generation and the interpretation of artifacts until you put things into that lung, right? Until you consolidate that lung. And then all of a sudden you start actually seeing the lung parenchyma itself. And so you'll have this shredded up pleura, right? The pleura is no longer that smooth linear line. Kind of gets, looks like one of my kids took a pair of scissors to it. Uh, and you have kind of a a little of a pocket that becomes hypochoic um, where you can see the consolidation of that lung. And it's usually surrounded by a penumbra of B lines. What we see here is kind of that shredded pleura and then kind of B lines from that shred, right? Um, and then in this situation, this is a patient that we had a um, long time ago with COVID, right? Um, and basically you have, um, you know, a subpleural consolidation. So this, um, shredded up plural, you can see it between the two rib shadows where you have just a slight consolidation of, um, you know, along that line. Um, and that, that plural just looks a little irregular. And that is followed up with the final pattern, which is basically the uh, effusion, right? That's what we talked about last week, where we put things in that pleural space uh, that's going to separate that lung from the diaphragm or from the posterior thoracic wall. And we're going to be able to see that separation with the anechoic fluid and sometimes hypo or uh, echogenic fluid kind of around that lung. And we talked all about, about the five different signs of a pleural effusion last week. But those are the different things, right? The different uh, basic findings that we're looking for in lung ultrasound. And so with that said, I want to turn our attention now to an interesting article that dropped. And it's actually about 11 years old, a little over 10 years old now. Right. And so this is the international evidence based guidelines for lung ultrasound. And interestingly, now fast forward a decade later, last year in 2022, they submitted a revised international evidence based guidelines. And a lot of the, the revised guidelines took this basic information, right? This is still foundational, still good um, information. And they said, okay, now we need to standardize some of these things, right? We need to standardize our machine settings. We need to standardize our, you know, our, our terminology. We need to do better and more nuanced research on each of these different things. So um, I didn't feel like it was helpful for us to go through point by point on the revised one, because that was a lot of high end level for kind of the, um, you know, the academics and the researchers. So I wanted to go back to this one, the 2012 International Evidence-Based Guidelines for Lung Ultrasound, because I thought it set a really good baseline for how then do we take this information and then go apply this information at the bedside, right? And so they took it basically in three different ways. Number one, what is this whole thing about sliding? Like, let's assess sliding. What does that mean? Number two, let's assess A versus B profile, right? What does that mean? And finally, number three, what does this whole consolidation thing mean, right? And we're going to basically take it in those three different chunks today. We're going to do what does sliding mean? What does A, A versus B mean? And what does C mean? And how do we use this information and the clinical information to make this decision? And I think I'm, I'm going to say this again, probably a couple of times throughout the presentation, because number one, I think is important. Number two, I want to make sure I don't forget to say it. Um, and I'm just going to emphasize it, right? And it, it fits right in here right now. What makes lung ultrasound different from any other thing that we scan? And I'd have to think there's probably an exception to this rule, but pretty much everything else that we scan, the one thing that makes lung ultrasound different is we aren't actually looking at the lung 
per se, right? And by what by what I mean by that is we're looking at the artifacts that are produced by the lung, right? As opposed to when we go and scan, say, the gallbladder, we're looking at the gallbladder itself. We see a, a wall. We see the fluid in the gallbladder. We see the stones in the gallbladder. We see the findings of cholecystitis. Same thing if we look at a fast exam, right? We're looking at free fluid around the kidney, around the liver, around the spleen, things like that. We're actually seeing the pathology, and we're able to make some pretty decent decisions off of that. What makes lung ultrasound different is the fact that we're looking at artifacts. We're looking at an A profile. We're looking at a B profile. Now, my analogy breaks down a little bit as we get into pleural effusions and we get into consolidations. But what this means, right, the implication for why we are, uh, why I'm even spending time bothering talking about this is that there is going to be some broad overlap between profiles in patients' ultimate pathologies, right? You can't say this profile equals this ICD-10 code, right? You can't say this profile equals pneumonia, right? Because there's various things that present in this way. And what we, what our job is as physicians is then to take that data that we're, that we're seeing on our lung ultrasound and then marry that up with the clinical presentation of the patient, right? Um, and then ask ourselves some very nuanced and subtle questions, which we'll get into here in a little bit to help us tease out, okay, if the Venn diagram has overlap, am I on the left side of the diagram or the right side of the diagram? Like, am I leaning towards maybe a pneumonia or am I leaning towards atelectasis? Am I leaning towards a pulmonary contusion or am I leaning towards pulmonary fibrosis? So things like that. Like, we're going to have to use this information and then interpret it and make decisions, which really gets at the heart of bedside ultrasound, right? Because if you think about bedside ultrasound as a philosophy of care, which I like to refer to, or as a means or methodology of care, right? We're going to the bedside, we're applying the probe, we're listening in this situation with our eyes, you know, with the ultrasound, uh, but we're, we're using the probe to, to, uh, to get, to collect data. And then we're in integrating that data with the clinical story, right. In a very much more raw and real way than if you we were to say, Oh, there's a gallstone there. Right. So that's one of the things I want to, we'll probably allude to that again, but I wanted to take that aside to really emphasize, this is what makes lung ultrasound unique, different, and even kind of just fun, right? It's just different than um, than everything else, and it makes it a little bit more fun, right? So the first thing we're talking about is three different columns. Back kind of back to the away from that that rabbit trail. We're going to talk about lung sliding. What does that mean? A versus B profile. What does that mean? And then consolidation profile. What does that mean? So first one is evaluation for pneumothorax or lung sliding, right? And so according to this document, according to the guidelines, there are four essential sonographic findings in pneumothorax, right? Absence of lung sliding, check. Presence of a lung point, interesting, we'll talk about that in just a sec. Absence of B lines, interesting, we'll talk about that in a minute. And then absence of lung pulse. So essentially, when we talk about lung sliding, right, we're talking about the the, the movement of the, the visceral and the parietal pleura against one another. Now, we can make some scenarios where that would not happen, right, where that movement would not happen, and the patient is still like no, does that have for pneumothorax? For example, if you go to somebody who has recently passed away and scan their lungs, there will be no lung movement, right? There'll be no lung sliding. So we can't automatically assume that absence of lung sliding equals pneumothorax because this patient is expired and just completely apneic, right? So this is why we add the other things, right? Um, if we see a lung point, that means at some point, and we'll kind of go to this, this diagram here um, as we kind of work on the algorithm, and I, I show this again, so we'll just zip past it here. Um, at, at some point, we're going to see a, um, a place where the lung is moving and a place where the lung is not moving. And so this slide we see on the left, this has complete movement, right? Um, left to right. And on the other side, we see no movement, right? So that's lack of lung sliding. So that gets us in our first decision tree of is there lung uh, sliding, yes or no? And then here is the lung pulse, right? Or excuse me, the lung point where you see no movement. And then at some point, they're going to take a breath and there'll be some movement moving into the screen. Uh, right there, see the movement there, you can see that point, and then it disappears, right? And so that's the edge of that pneumothorax where the visceral pleura is peeled away from the parietal pleura um, in this patient uh, who has a pneumothorax, right? So if you see that, that's highly specific for a pneumothorax, right? And we know that, okay, the patient's not completely apneic because I see movement elsewhere, but I see this edge where the, lung, the pneumothorax happens, right? So that's point number one. We'll go back to our original topic thing here. The second one is absence of B lines, right? And so if you think about it, we'll go back to this slide here. 
when you have apposition of the visceral and the parietal pleura, right, you have that reverberation between the two layers, right, which is going to give you these teeny little comet tails, which we can see in that left-hand image where there's movement. You can see that just little icicle hanging from the pleural line. And then if there is some thicken enough thickening of the interstitial space, you'll see a beeline. However, look on the right-hand side of the screen where we have no lung sliding, right? There is no apposition of the visceral and parietal pleura, which means there's no reverberation there. And there's no um, beeline artifact from the lung that's up against the other side of the pleura. And so when you have a pneumothorax, you completely lose this. And I remember having a patient years ago where we're having a difficult time seeing lung sliding, um, but I saw this comet tail artifacts. I'm like, I know the lungs are up, right? So cognitively, I can move on. And then I can find some other reasons for why this patient's doing what they're doing. Um, because I have that reverberation artifact that's produced by the lungs. Um, and so that kind of gets us kind of down through this decision tree a little bit more. And then the last one is this lung pulse. And again, I, I'll, I can superimpose an image and post here. Um, but imagine you're scanning the lung, right? Um, and you have the patient take a deep breath and hold it, right? If I were to scan myself and take a deep breath and hold it, if I scan the left side, there is going to be some movement of my heart, right? Which is going to cause some translational movement of the lung in association with my heart. And so what I'll see is kind of this faint, you know, rhythmic back and forth uh, of that lung sliding, even though there's not full respiratory lung sliding, there may be that faint rhythmic back and forth um, of that lung um, as my heart's beating, and that's essentially the lung pulse. And so when you have a pneumothorax, you lose that lung pulse because you lose that apposition of the visceral and parietal pleura. And so those three things that we were talking about that um, are the, the absent signs in pneumothorax are things that you would expect to see when you have apposition of that visceral and the parietal pleura together with one another, right? And so those are the three things that we're going to look for for pneumothorax as we go through this whole uh, decision tree of do they have lung sliding? Yes or no, right? And I'll um, put up some more, more images on the YouTube channel so we can kind of look at those later. Um, but the second column of things that I want to look through is called the evaluation of interstitial syndrome, right? And so this is that A versus A profile versus B profile, right? And so as we, we've now we've already identified, okay, this patient with dyspnea has lung sliding. Okay, we can kind of take that whole pneumothorax thing off the table. Now, what is the lung profile look like to help me understand kind of where on the map of pathologies this patient might land and kind of narrow that down? Because that's the ultimate goal, right? I have a patient who's dyspneic. There's a million and a half reasons why they're dyspneic. And I'm trying to use my ultrasound to narrow that down so that I can have um, either a narrower set of things to work through, or I finally get to the thing and can start treating it, right? Uh, so the second thing is evaluate the A versus B profile and evaluate for this thing called interstitial syndrome, which is represented by the B lines, right? So again, back to a definition of B lines um, from this document, right? The definition is B lines are discrete laser-like projections, right? That arise from the plural line, right? And we saw that on the images. We can remember that. They extend to the bottom of the screen without fading, right? And they move synchronously with the lung. So these are the four categories of B lines um, that we will see as we scan through these patients. Now, the question becomes, okay, you've said in previous lectures, you said two weeks ago, Matt, that it's normal to have some B lines. Correct, right? We're not completely dry um, you know, in individuals, we have some interstitial space. And so some B lines are going to be generated mostly in the posterior lung fields, mostly in the inferior lung fields, but we may see some from time to time. So the question then becomes, okay, fine. If you have some, but you're saying B lines are pathologic, what is the definition of patho pathologic B lines or, or stated differently? What is the definition of a positive region that we're scanning? Right. And so according to this document and the, the, research that supports it, right? The definition of a positive region and region is where you've got your probe, right? Um, or as we've defined in the past, you know, the zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four, we'll see a picture of that later, um, is the presence of three or more B lines in that region, right? Um, between the rib spaces. So as you're scanning, you can kind of count, oh, I got one there, I got two there, I got three there, or one there, two there, well, or it's just so many that you just can't even distinguish them anymore, right? And so that's the definition of a positive region. And as you start then scanning around the lungs, right, you can make a mental map of where are my regions positive, right? And then from there, you can say, 
you know, is it left, right? Is it up, down? Is it front, back? And start kind of really piecing this together, right? And where this becomes important is the pathologies associated with the B lines are numerous, right? You can say things that are associated with B lines are pulmonary edema, right? That's the most common one we think of. Like there's a lot of published studies about, hey, here's a bunch of B lines in cardi, like in, in patients with a heart failure. Or some of my favorite studies about this, hey, here's um, a patient who's on dialysis, right? They got pulmonary edema. We dialyze them and we watch these B lines go away as they get dialyzed, right? This is a really classic um, example of B lines. But it can also be associated with interstitial pneumonia. In the last several years of COVID has taught us this in spades, right? This is back in you know 2020 when COVID was first starting to hit the United States. There was a plethora of literature about how lung ultrasound can be used to evaluate for patients with pneumonia or with with COVID pneumonia. And the problem is, right? The, there's interlap or overlap between what is COVID pneumonia look like versus what is just a regular typical interstitial pneumonia look like. But that being said, it is a very helpful tool to say, hmm, this is a high risk patient, right? I see these this pattern, this beeline pattern on them. I wonder if they've got COVID this time, right? So this is uh, another example, but you can also see beelines in things like pulmonary fibrosis, right? And parenchymal lung disease. And I remember when I was a fellow, I went up to the MICU and started scanning with Z, um, and you know, there's some papers that say if the space between the B lines is X many millimeters, it's pulmonary edema. If it's X more millimeters, it's pulmonary fibrosis. And so we measured that, right? I don't know if for us it ever really, really panned out. Um, but you know, there's some talk about how like patients with like this interstitial thickening from just fibrosis can have the same B profile because it really relies on that same thickening of that space, right? Um, and similarly, we can see this in patients with ARDS or atelectasis or pulmonary contusions or pulmonary infarctions or even people who have neoplasia uh, of the lungs, right? These are all things that can be associated with B-lines. So then what we need to do as providers is start asking ourselves certain questions. And that is, what is the clinical scenario, right? And that's where it starts. Like, what does this patient present with? If they present with cough and a fever versus I just got hit by a semi-truck, those are two very different clinical scenarios. And it's going to lead us down a certain path, right? You're not going to say if you got hit by a semi-truck and you have B-lines that that's their COVID, right? I, maybe it could be, but it's probably going to be their pulmonary contusion versus I have cough and a fever and it's 2020. You know, I'm kind of leaning towards that COVID side. And since they don't have a history of getting hit by a semi-truck, I think we can rule out pulmonary contusion on this one, right? That's kind of how we're going to start with that. So what's the clinical scenario? Then we ask ourselves, where do we see these things? Is it unilateral? Is it bilateral, right? And then once we've established the laterality, is it just diffuse? Or do you see little splotches here and there, right? Because, you know, as we look at this list of pathologies, certain things, pulmonary edema, for example, isn't really specific to one individual like splotch versus another individual splotch. It's just going to accumulate in the lungs. So we're going to see that in a homogenous pattern. We're going to see it in the diffuse and bilateral pattern versus someone who's got like a, I keep coming back to pneumonia. It's going to be this splotchy pattern or pulmonary contusion. It's going to be in one area where the patient got injured, right? Um, these are various different signs that we can look to or nuances or subtleties that we can look to um, as we scan these patients. And again, location is kind of the final one. Is it anterior, posterior? Is it apical versus basal? Um, and there was a lot of studies in the COVID era where they're talking like, okay, what is the most positive lung zone for COVID, right? Um, which is, gets us to our kind of our lung zoning. Um, and this is kind of what we saw um, and the, the the standardized nomenclature for how we're going to describe where these things are at. Um, the left picture is from this international guidelines. So zones one through four are kind of the anterior and lateral lung fields. Um, now, this other picture on the right, it was taken from a, stud, a paper in the COVID era, and they numbered it a little bit differently. I'm going to still go with the one on the left being one through four, um, and then the, the posterior fields being something different. Um, but what COVID added is those three posterior fields where you can get a nice, well-circumscribed view of these patients' lungs by looking at these kind of seven zones on each side, right? So there's 14 zones total, right? Um, so with that said, let's take a few different scenarios and just kind of talk through kind of what are some things that we could potentially... Uh, or features that we could potentially see that would help nuance us out to those different diagnoses. As we've looked at the patient and say, okay, we no longer have an A profile, we have a B profile. What do these B profile things mean, right? So pulmonary edema, the big first obvious one, right? Um, we're gonna see B lines. We see the example of, you know, of B lines here. So rib, rib, plural line at the very near field, right? And you see those lines going all the way to the bottom of the screen. And you can definitely see there's discrete B lines. And there's an area of like in the middle, like there's patchy confluent B lines. So there's a lot of these things. So this is a positive lung region, right? It, that we're scanning here. And so pulmonary edema is going to be, and I put this on with the hashtags that look kind of like tagging it. 
it was, was kind of cool. It was an aesthetic, right? Um, but basically, it's going to be a bilateral thing, right? Pulmonary edema is going to be bilateral. It's going to be decently homogenous. So if you look, um, you know, there may be a gradation as you go, you know, add pulmonary edema. So you may have fewer in the apex, apices and more in the base, but you aren't going to see like, you know, an area of normal and an area of abnormal, an area of normal and abnormal. It's going to be just kind of this diffuse homogenous as you scan apical all the way down to base and kind of go you know, laterally, go posteriorly, you're going to see kind of the homogeneity of the, the B lines. Um, again, you're going to see them, uh, you, you always see them kind of basal and posterior because that's where gravity dependency uh, pulls fluids, right? But as you increase the amount of pulmonary edema that you have, you're going to see them more in the anterior lung fields and you're going to see them more in the apical lung fields where gravity tends to not allow fluid to settle, right? Uh, so, um, that's going to be kind of a little nuance you can see. And then additionally, you, you'll oftentimes have like a smooth pleural line because it really doesn't disrupt the pleura. It's just, you're putting fluid in that interstitial space between the alveoli and thickening that area. Right. So these are the characteristics of pulmonary edema. And again, the story has got to be consistent, right? So dialysis patient who missed their dialysis patient whose heart failure is not taking their medicines, things like that. Like you're going to get pictures that look like this, these different characteristics in that clinical story. Now compare that with 2020, you know, we got COVID pneumonia. Um, and now we're presenting with patients with B lines, right? Okay, so they got some interstitial thickening, but what's causing that, right? Their clinical scenario is they're coming in with cough and a fever, right? It's 2020, they got COVID, right? Uh, or they might have COVID. And so what we'll see is, you know, it's probably going to still have the same bilateral nature of these B lines. If we scan both sides, we're probably going to find them, you know, areas of B lines on both sides. However, contrasted to the patient with pulmonary edema, these are probably going to be more likely to be patchy and less likely to be homogeneously distributed throughout the lungs, right? Um, and Given the fact that we know that people are either upright or laying flat on their back, right? And if you got, you know, pneumonia and you feel really crummy, you're probably just laying around in bed. There's going to be some gravity dependency, which is going to pull some of this stuff in the posterior lung fields. And so the, the studies were showing in 2020, like, hey, look, a lot of these things are going to be seen mostly in those posterior lung fields, right? And posterior basal lung fields, right? And the other thing that was described in this situation, there's a little nuance in these subpleural consolidations, which you can see in this image is that lung goes back and forth and kind of hides behind, be, behind ribs, kind of between breaths here. But it's that area where the pleural line is not smooth, right? We've talked in the previous one, the pleural line was smooth, Right. In this one, we see just kind of that shredding of that pleural line. We just see kind of looks like some scissors just kind of took, you know, were taken to that, that pleural line. And that is that small, teeny little subpleural consolidation where you have the 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 locus of infection and kind of that penumbra around it with some of the B lines. Right. And so that's an example of what interstitial pneumonia might look like. Switching gears to someone who's got some chronic lung disease, some pulmonary fibrosis, right? Maybe their story isn't that they have heart failure and they haven't been taking their medicines or they got, they, maybe they don't have fever and cough. Maybe they're just kind of worsening shortness of breath and they got this baseline dyspnea. Uh, they're known, known well to the pulmonologist, you know, whatever scenario you want to kind of concoct on that one. Um, we're going to see, we can see this, right? You can see this bilateral appearance, you know, it may be patchy depending on kind of what areas are fibrotic. Um, you may have some of the fragmented pleura, but you're going to have kind of the similar beeline profile. So you have to think through what's their past history, kind of, is it following the pattern? What's their clinical story? Compare that with a patient with ARDS, right? You can have bilateral lung, uh, um, B lines can be in that patchy appearance. Again, fragmented pleura. You may have subpleural consolidations to that. So has the patient then clinically been in the ICU for a little while, been on the ventilator for a while? Like, do they have a story that's consistent with their ARDS? And if so, you can use this to kind of help monitor their progress as you're ventilating the patient and trying to get those lungs to, to heal, right? Um, and finally, well, we got a couple others. It's atelectasis, right? Now, most of the times I've seen atelectasis in the form of, you know, consolidation. So you can see some consolidations of the atelectasis without air bronchograms. But when there's consolidations, there's going to be a penumbra of B lines. And so is it unilateral? Is it bilateral? Maybe you just have unilateral atelectasis. It should be extremely focal in the posterior inferior lung fields. Um, and the pleura shouldn't necessarily be affected because it's just collapse of lungs, right? It's not uh, anything that's affecting that pleura um, per se. Um, compare with a pulmonary contusion, right? Here's a patient with um, probably going to have a very focal and unilateral findings. So they're going to have a history of trauma. Um, that pleura may not be affected, right? Um, depending on the severity of the contusion. And so the scenario that you see, the place that you look at it, are going to be highly impactful for what you end up you know, diagnosing the patient with. And so um, this is kind of the exercise we want to walk us through. The paper spends a little bit of time talking about this, where what are the findings? What are these nuances that you can see? How does that, plus the clinical 
hypothetical scenario, then guide your decision making in terms of what's causing this. And I think if you take anything away from this, understand that beelines don't automatically equal pulmonary edema, right? Beelines equal anything that causes thickening of that interstitial space. And then from there, you need to use your clues in your ultrasound, your clues in your clinical story to then help narrow that differential down to what you think is actually going on. Right. So that's part two, right? Part one was the, they have lung siding. Part two was, you know, do they have an A versus B profile? And what does the B profile mean? And part three, and this will be the short part, is con- evaluating for lung consolidation, right? And this one gets a little bit more narrow in terms of its scope. Uh, but still, there is some, you know, some things to take, you know, take note of, right? Um, so technically, by definition, a lung consolidation is a slub plural echo pore space, right? Um, and it might have a tissue type echo texture. Now this one example, is, this example of consolidation is highly echogenic. Um, the subplural consolidation will probably be echo pore, but it, they're all subplural, right? The, uh, the, the lung is filled with things, it collapses down and it has that tissue like echo texture, right? And so things that can be associated with pathologies that, um, that you know, present with lung consolidations are pneumonias or pulmonary emboli. You can have those little subplural wedge consolidations or lung cancer with metastases. Again, small little consolidations along the pleura. Atelectasis can do this, right? You can have a collapse of those lungs to see a little bit of a consolidation. And then finally, pulmonary conditions can do this as well. And so the clinical scenario is really gonna guide and direct how you interpret these consolidations based on what you're seeing, um, based or based on the what you're seeing on the ultrasound. Uh, so with that said, I kind of want to wrap things up. We're gonna go a little short today, but we want to wrap things up with a few additional considerations as you're scanning some lungs, right? And the first one is always remember the Alara principle, right? And the Alara principle for uh, for just a purpose of a reminder is the as low as reasonably achievable principle. So lung or uh, ultrasound is generally considered to be pretty safe, right? We scan eyeballs, we scan babies. Um, you know, these are things that, you know, it's not, doesn't have, it's not associated with the ionizing radi- radiation of a CT scan or an x-ray or things like that. And so uh, it's pretty safe to do, but it is a form of energy, right? We are putting energy into the body and whenever you put energy into the body, there are bio effects that the energy can have. Most of the time it's like, who really cares? Like if you're scanning a muscle and you put a little energy into that muscle, whoop de doo like it's, it's not really going to do a ton to my muscle. But when you have certain sensitive structures, I mentioned eyeballs and babies because those are two sensitive structures, you need to be a little bit more careful because putting energy into those things can have effects, particularly in the context of mechanical effects and then thermal effects. So the thermal effects is easy, right? You put energy in the body, energy is dissipated in the form of heat. So ultrasound can heat up tissues, right? If you scan long enough. In fact, there's a whole field of therapeutic ultrasound where the whole purpose is to heat up a tissue with the ultrasound, right? Uh, So that's the thermal index. The mechanical index is a little bit more difficult to get your head around. However, it is the effects that the ultrasound wave, that compression, decompression has on the tissue, right? As that tissue compresses and decompresses. And so the analogy I can think of is imagine yourself on a nice speedboat, right? You're going water skiing or you're tubing or something like that. And the person driving the boat hits the gas, right? And all of a sudden that white plume emerges from under the water behind the boat, right? And that is the plume that's generated by the prop as that prop is spinning. Now, what's happening is that prop is spinning fast and it's pulling water, sucking water into it, and then pushing that water out and then using that thrust to move the boat forward. But in the process of that, it compresses that water and that water decompresses and the air that's in the water comes out of suspension or whatever, um, and creates those little micro air bubbles. And that's called cavitation, right? And then you see that plume of it eventually just kind of settles back out and goes back into its its normal steady state, right? That cavitation principle can also happen in ultrasound, right? As you compress and decompress that tissue. Um, And so we measure this, you know, cavitation in the mechanical index, which is the maximum negative um, force essentially that, um, you know, that is applied to this tissue. Uh, And it's listed up at the top of the screen is the MI uh, index. And there's certain FDA approved bio bio ranges that are that are safe. And most machines have presets that keep you within those parameters. And it's no problem, right? But what's interesting is in lung ultrasound, there was a series of studies put out by a guy named Doug Miller, right? He's up at the University of Michigan. I read his studies or some of his studies and I actually heard him speak a couple of years ago at a conference. And he's done research on rats and ultrasound and the effects that ultrasound has on the rat lungs in creating this pulmonary alveolar hemorrhage, right? Um, Or this pulmonary capillary hemorrhage, PCH. And they've looked at 
what are the things in ultrasound that will increase the risk of pulmonary capillary hemorrhage? Um, you know, does ventilating the, the, the rats long or just, you know, positive pressure or like, I guess one of the studies was adding PEEP. Does that do it? Do certain, you know, sedative agents do it? Um, do certain machine settings do it? Um, and they were kind of teasing out like what causes increased risk and decreased risk. And what's interesting is like, none of this has been replicated in humans, but it's feasible, right? That, enough energy over enough period of time can cause potentially some pulmonary capillary hemorrhaging in the lungs, right? And for most people who are young and healthy, and if you're talking about such a small focal spot, whatever, right? You know, you have a small little bleed and it heals and you get to be better. And, you know, you'll probably clinically never even know this. Um, but it illustrates what I think is interesting is this Alara principle is ultrasound is not completely benign. It's generally considered safe, safe enough that we do it on ourselves. We do it on our patients. We scan with it but you probably shouldn't be scanning for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours in the same spot, right? So it has implications for training sessions, but such something to be mindful of. And I'd say maybe that window, and again, none of this has been verified in human data. And there's no numbers in human data, but you know, as you're scanning potentially a neonate, just be mindful of their lungs are more sensitive, right? Than someone who's going to be a, you know, 45 year old adult, right? And so um, just kind of always keep the Alara principle in mind as you're scanning, scan for sure, but do the lowest amount of time, lowest amount of energy um, that's necessary to do to accomplish the, pur accomplish the purpose and the goals for which you're scanning, right? Well, that said, the second additional consideration with lung ultrasound is be mindful of the factors that affect your artifacts, right? And so we talked about earlier on, and I'll reiterate it here, the reason why lung ultrasound is different is you're evaluating artifacts and interpreting that artifact, right? Which means since I'm not looking for a structure, right? When I'm not looking for fluid or I'm not looking for a wall or things like that, my, my machine settings can affect my production of artifacts. And so here's an example. Uh, on the left side, I scanned, this is myself, right? I scanned myself the other day because I wanted to get some examples. Um, so on the left side, I scanned my whatever side I could reach, um, I think it was my right side, but I don't remember. Um, with the fast exam preset, right? And on the right, or the the right side of the screen, same area of my body, right, that I was scanning, I scanned it with a more appropriate preset. And in this situation, our cardiac one worked best, but I've been recreating our our preset to to make it a lung preset. So ideally, a lung preset, right? Um, and the difference here is the machine settings are different, right? We've turned off filters, we turned off harmonics, um, things like that. And you can see the same place, there's a couple B lines that are visible on the right side of the screen that are not as visible on the left side of the screen. And so your machine settings can affect your ability to see B lines. And so what you want to do is always make sure you're on a lung preset because you're, it's, the machine is set to be able to optimize for the settings that um, that will help optimize your your visibility of of your your lung artifacts essentially, um, and so your your machine settings can have a huge impact on the outcomes that you get in your patients, right? So uh, that's the second one. Number, remember your Lara principle. Two, be mindful of the factors that affect your artifact. And three, and this is the piece that I pulled from the 2022 guidelines, is further research should be aimed at standardizing acquisition and quantifying findings, right? And I think where this is you know, becomes really important, it kind of ties into the last point, is now that lung ultrasound has been established as a thing, right? 10 years ago, it was like, wow, this is kind of interesting. And, you know, people were still kind of getting used to it. And, you know, it hadn't been, you know, wasn't as ubiquitous as it may be now, right? Maybe we have to go back a little bit more than 10 years ago, because it was pretty much a thing then, right? But now that this has become a, a, a very standard part of bedside POCUS, bedside lung ultra or bedside ultrasound, we need to start eliminating some of the variables, presets, for example, that may affect our ability to get really solid uh, quantitative data, right? A lot of the stuff that's been done up until, you know, this doc, the second document came out is qualitative data. Like, hey, look, I see beelines. It's associated with this thing, right? Now, what does quantitative data look like, especially as we look forward, right? And uh, one of the interesting things that's coming on the horizon, I was able to talk to a bunch of vendors um, at the most recent ASEP conference that I went to. And we had a lecture on this, you know, a couple months or a couple weeks ago with AI, like AI, artificial intelligence is the next big wave of technology that's going to be hitting ultrasound. It's, it's the, we're starting to see it hit right now, but a lot of these AI algorithms are being developed. And what we're going to see is various different ways that computerized technology, right? Um, artificial intelligence can start helping us generate an image right? Or help us interpret the image. And so a lot of people are work, coming up with 
A or B line counters or auto EF you know, calculators or bladder volume calculators, things like this, where you just put your probe down on the patient. It will identify your rib, rib, pleural line and your B lines. It'll count those. And it'll give you this thing is positive. This thing is, this is negative, right? And it's going to start giving us this information. So now it makes us easier to, 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 um, to identify stuff. And, and there's gonna be advantages there in that it will start standardizing kind of our, uh, our assessment because historically ultrasound has been very operator dependent. Well, maybe we can take some of that operator dependency out of the equation with AI. However, as everyone who's involved in creating AIs would say, AIs are only as good or these language or, or these um, models are only as good as the data that it's being fed. Right. And so if we're feeding it a heterogeneous, um, data set right that's going to affect the outcomes that we're going to be able to get and so what the research what the writers of this new document are saying is now that we've kind of validated this whole principle we need a lot more um you know in or not a lot more research in kind of really narrowing down these definitions standardize these definitions being very precise with our inputs so that as we start applying these things to patients either in real time when i'm scanning or in the context of these artificial intelligence mod you know, modeling, uh, we can get very good, helpful, precise outputs um, as we as we um, kind of move forward in the future. And so, with that said, I think we're going to wrap things up here. Uh, but this was just a little bit of a an opportunity to take the 2020 or 2012 um, lung ultrasound guidelines, dissect that a little bit, look at how um, lung ultrasound can then be applied based on the information um, that we have been talking about over the last few weeks and really tease out in the different scenarios kind of clinically, what does this mean? You know, what's a clinical scenario? You know, do I have lung sliding, A, a profile, B profile, consolidations, effusions, kind of what does all that mean? And how do I then piece that together uh, to come up with a diagnosis or at least start, start with a management plan for the patient in front of me? So with that said, Let's wrap things up here and we'll throw it open. Are there any questions about this material or things that we talked about over the course of the last three weeks?